we're talking audiophile today. Audiophile vinyl records with 45 audiophile uh, friend Michael from Dusseldorf, Germany. Hello, Michael. Hello, Mazzy. Thanks for having me. Oh, this will be fun. Now, I did mention Michael before. Uh, I did a shout out uh, about a week ago or so. He's uh, relatively new, at least new to me, uh, the last two, three months, maybe? One month. Yeah. Oh, got it. even. Okay. His focus is very narrow, but it's really, it's something that really interests me. And, and he'll talk about it as we go on. We're going to showcase some audiophile records, but instead of just showcasing a bunch of records and holding it up, we want to talk about the good, bad, and the ugly of audiophile pressings, why we like them, maybe some things we don't like about them, how, why are they so expensive, uh, just I different left, things I left about the ugly them. part to you. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, we'll go back and forth about that. And a, another reason I'm doing this, I was looking back and my second most viewed video over the last year has been one I did on mobile fidelity audiophile records. So even those of you who aren't into it, it seems to me maybe it goes beyond the vinyl community here and it goes into uh, people who are into hi-fi and audiophile stereo equipment. We may cross into that a little bit, but this isn't really about the equipment, although that will come into play, I think, somewhat. Plays its role, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what you play this uh, stuff on. And again, this is not a snooty, over-the-top thing, because some people look at it and they say, oh my God, I would never play that much uh, for a record. So we're going to talk about that too. So we'll just see how it goes. Put your comments below and um, let's take it away. So um, let me start with this. Uh, Michael's channel, 45 uh, RPM audiophile, is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. And you're mostly showcasing audiophile uh, vinyl records. So tell me how you got into it. Is it your? Is it the only records you buy now? Just anything you want as an introduction. Okay, I came back to vinyl and I had a decent stereo equipment from streaming. And, and then I met a guy who built stereo equipment on a very, very high level. We got acquainted and, and I came into a learning phase and I tried to defend streaming. But when I heard his equipment, his records, I, re I really fast recognized I will never reach that point with streaming. Even a high, got, is it a high res streaming? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like Tidal or something or like that? No, Ben, no, no, own FLAC files, okay. uh, high res files on an, on an, on computer. Got it. Not, got not it. streaming like Spotify. That's, that's not so good. And I recognized no, no chance. I, I've heard records and I said, no, I will never get there. And then I got back to vinyl and was very happy and got into electronic music, avant garde electronic music. And on a parallel train, I, I, I bought some Morphys, I bought some analog productions. I said, Ooh, oh my God, this is as good as it gets. As it gets. That's, that's miles away from, from the other stuff. And I bought my, my electronic records too, but then I decided makes no sense. When I put on my, my hi-fi equipment, I put on a record, I put on those audiophile discs and, and I love it. And I really bought a lot of this electronic stuff and said, no, don't do that anymore. It's, it's waste of money. And so- well, For you, I mean, it, is it because now- For me. For the most part, electronic music is digital to begin with, I would imagine. And, and again, but I'm not one that all of us put my nose up. Oh my God, it has to be an analog uh, production. It ha I don't mean the company analog, but analog sourced, digital is bad. It, it, it does come down to the mastering so much because there's some quote audiophile things, like even some early and uh, certain MoFi titles just aren't that great. And I, I used to cite on, on my video, I'm not a fan for the most part of, it goes back to the late 80s, uh, granted, but That's the, the Beatle Box, 
the beetle box and mofa it's it's a little heavy handed but i think it could have been the mastering choices they made then and they didn't actually have the uh, first generation tapes as well you're you're absolutely right because i think mofi has to be split in two parts there is the part before they fold their business and then came back when I think Music Direct or Direct Music bought them and then yeah. they came back. And this is for sure the better part. Those older Mof Mofis, also the, the, uh, uh, the Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, is not that hot. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. I don't People have it anymore. Oh. I think as we go occasionally, even if it doesn't relate, I'm going to showcase things because people do like seeing records. Uh, going back, just talking to MoFi, one of the best MoFi's, and we'll, we'll continue with this conversation, for me of the last decade, and not less than that, but is this one. Um, yes. And the pink already one or the black one? It's out of print, you know, uh, morning phase. Is this morning? No, this is not. This is the sea change. I'm sorry. The other is moody it, record. Is it the pink know. one or the black one? Uh, this is the black one. Uh, better, yeah. Yeah. They did a pink version, which I, I, you know, I'm not against color vinyl. A lot of, there's are some people who say a color, color vinyl is always inferior. I don't think it's necessarily inferior if the vinyl's the same. Unfortunately, you just can't see what it looks like. On black, you can see imperfections, scratches, you know, imperfections. I think a, a good colored vinyl on, a, on good vinyl Mastered and Press will, will sound as good as black, but that's a whole other conversation. But this is one of my favorite of all time of the MoFi collection. Totally agree. Totally. I, I have another one. Okay. You know this one? Oh, you know, I don't have that record on Vaughn. I love the music. I have a compact disc of that. I love that record. I love Dead Can Dance. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's a spirit chaser. And this one, it's mobile fidelity on top that means it's not from the original master or not from an analog master yeah why don't you explain the difference because show show up the matched head close so we can read it if you can't it, it's can you it's, read it it's hard to read because it's on gray um uh, but i think i had do i have one here i don't think i i collected one um it, it just says mobile fidelity sound lab other the name of the company on top Instead, right. instead of original master recording, yeah. So, so and this sounds gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, gorgeous. It I bet it does. I love that. Always to be analog first master pressing. I absolutely agree. I, I, I absolutely agree. With Isn't that. the vocalist? Is that Lisa Gerard, who's the vocalist yeah. on that? Her voice is stunning and a, a, a great record. I mean, just to. For you music fans out there who are not audiophiles, if you're watching this, I mean, she does the vocals on the soundtrack for Gladiator, and yeah. that it, it's just it's a stunning record. Her solo stuff is great too, but I'm a big fan of that. Um, but why don't you let's why don't you kind of describe or mention? Let's mention uh, the audiophile companies that we might talk about. Not all of them in detail, obviously. Audio Productions, Analog Productions, excuse me, Analog Productions. I'm a huge fan of Sam Records. I really love Sam Records. This Mofi. is audio production. Oh, audio, analog productions? So. Analog productions, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of those, not all of them are mastered by Kevin Gray. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a Rye Cooter and VM Bot, and it's uh, Indian uh, acoustic. Yeah. A gorgeous record. Now these, some of these again, and we'll get into this, are 45 RPM. So they expand them over two discs rather than 33 and a third. But continue, audio production, Sam. Then great label is Impex. I don't know that one. This is a box they did from uh, Three Blind Mice. Three Blind Mice is a Japanese blue note from the 70s. This box is hilarious. It's, it's, it's a real beauty. You, you still can get it. And this now, is one about the, that label. I don't know about that label. Where are they based? 
You mean impacts or, or the uh, three yeah. blind mice? Impacts. Impacts is uh, um, Japanese based, I think, but I'm not sure. And and they are in the in the typical uh, uh, um, audio file stuff. The latest editions are uh, Aldi Miola. Um, I, I, give me a second. I, yeah, it's okay. right here. As he's talking, uh, I'm going to show more of those analog productions because analog productions, you, you can get a lot of their work out of Music Direct. I showed the, uh, the, this version is an incredible version, the best version I've ever heard about this. I did say this in another one of my videos. This is one of my best sounding albums I have in my collection. Uh, 1967, Peter, Paul, and Mary, album 1700. It's an amazing, a lot of acoustic, uh, and, and a lot of acoustic records, you know, a lot of people like audiophile acoustic and jazz. It seems like the collectors of that go in that uh, direction. And they maybe because they seem to be older, I don't know, collectors oh, that can buy and afford this stuff. This is the one I'm talking about. This is again, Impex. Oh, that's a San Francisco show. Yeah. I saw that what? show. Gorgeous, gorgeous record. And another one which, which is quite famous is this one, the Grand Jazz. I have that. That's great, too. Yeah. That's great. That reminds me, too, Analog Productions of this. Um, <laughs> sometimes older records, again, uh, you, you, a companion would, would be go to and watch Michael Fremer's 100 uh, audio source it, it, records it, 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 still yeah. buy. And it, it's an amazing video. It's exhausting. Yeah. And, of course, I think all of a sudden after he did that video, all these records started selling again. Uh, this was an old record that Framer, uh, Michael Framer, who's um, a champion of, of analog records and vinyl, uh, even during the C CD heyday, found a used copy of this in a store and got uh, Chad Kassam at Analog Productions to do uh, get the tapes and do a version of this. And it's a gorgeous record. It's a uh, mm -hmm. small big band master uh, masterpieces by Duke Ellington. Uh, it's just really, really Johnny Hodges on it, Billy Strayhorn, who uh, on a lot, most of uh, Duke Ellington records. But what other labels? I mean, again, some of us, and this is a thing where some people like it or, or not, like I see on the vinyl community, and let's bring it back there for a minute. A lot of people like to showcase uh, mobile fidelity. And I think there is uh, not always a good thing, but people will grab a MoFi just because it says mobile fidelity. And it might yeah. not be a great sounding record. What, one I've seen a few people buy lately, and I, and I like the record. The thing is, I haven't heard it, and this is really bad probably to say, but uh, I'm a big Bob Dylan fan, and I have a handful of the D Bob Dylan mobile fidelity mono things, but they did edition of uh, the basement tapes. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard it, but mm -hmm. I can't imagine that, I mean, it's not an audio file recording, it's these tapes that done in the, literally in the basement of Big Pink, for, sort of as demos. I mean, I can't imagine how great that sounds. And for me, that wouldn't be a one area I would go. I mean, for Bob Dylan, and we've showed this before, early, wonderful acoustic guitar, 45 RPM, incredible sounding. And the other one, uh, Blonde on Blonde. And this is, I believe, over, Four records, three or four records. Uh, Are you more into the mono versions or into the stereo versions? Which this one do is you mono. Um, you know, I, I think this is mono. It's funny. No, I think that's stereo. Oh, is it I'm stereo? not sure, but I think that's Could stereo. Be. And the other thing, a, a, a little, uh, we're talking about the later MoFi's. A good little thing. Look on the back of these, and the guy they've had to master lately over the last five, six years. His name is Krieg Wunderlich. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's German or, or American German. Probably. Whatever. He does such a great job. He has to be. <laughs> he has a great ear. And any, you could almost guarantee anything by him is yeah. going to be great. The only one that I bought, you know, that I, I, I will say there was one mobile record I bought, Mobile Fidelity, that came out, I think, a year ago. And I was very disappointed with it. And I think the reality is the tapes are not really that great. And it's one of my favorite double rock and roll records is uh, Derek and the Domino's Layla. Okay. I got that and I did not like it. And I have an early Polydor or RSO. To me, it sounded better. And I don't know if, if, if it's a tape they got or so. And, and he also uh, mastered that one. So that's the only one that I didn't really love. 
Yeah, I have to. I have it, but I haven't been so deep into it. I can't uh, uh, argue with that on, with with you on this one. Uh, Another and one. This will be interesting. You know why? Because at the end of this month, I will get the electric recording company version of this record of love. You need to tell people about the electric recording company because it's fascinating. It and is. It drive people here crazy. Like when you hear what they do, how much they charge. And okay. I, I need two minutes. <laughs> you can have um, as long as you want. Okay. Um, first, we have to talk about the mastering process. They have this 50 year old, completely valve driven system from Autophone. They bought it or found it somewhere in Namibia. Then bring it over to England and need, needed three to five years to put it back together. They found the uh, um, description, I don't know the English term, the way, the manual. They found the manual somewhere in Russia and then they started to put a, a shitload of money into it and then they have their completely valve-driven mastering system. Then, they go to companies and that's a brilliant idea you you i'm really uh, eager to hear your opinion because you are uh, very uh, uh, informed about those this industry they go to the companies uh, for example um what what is um deca and said i want to do 300 copies copies of this record can you give me the master tapes and in my opinion big company says 300 <laughs> go for it no problem 300 take what you want it's a different thing if you go to them and say i want to do 3000 5000 or i want the rights for three years it's it's difficult but if you say 300 yeah that's a whole and, and i want you to continue with that about that company but that's something that I know about on a different side of it because uh, as a photography agent, I, I represent commercial photographers as well as their, uh, I don't wanna say catalog, their archive of images. I frequency license, frequently license existing images. And it's not unlike how these labels and artists, most of the labels are licensing to these third parties like Mobile Fidelity, like Music Matters Jazz, um, not Tone Poet because poet, that's done in-house at Blue Note, part of Capital and the Universal Music Group. But what you do is you license, you grant a company a license, and that license is limited. The license could be a, a combination of things, a number of copies. So like you say, 300 copies, or in Mobile Fidelity's case, it's usually three or 5,000, like depending if it's vinyl or SACD. Plus you can be limited to do just 45 RPM or mm -hmm. 33 RPM. My guess is uh, Mobile Fidelity can only do 45 RPM Dylan right now because Columbia wants to keep Dylan in house and they can sell a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. Now, sometimes they might do it as well because, and, and so usually what you do, you get a, an exclusive license or a non-exclusive. Again, a th rarely will a third party get an exclusive license. Although they might get it for a time period like, okay, Mobile Fidelity wants to license 45 RPM to three or 5,000 Dylan records. Maybe they have a window of three years or five years to produce them, or they print up you know, the entire run and that's it. And they can sell them as long as they last, but they cannot print anymore. And of going back and we'll get to Music Matters Jazz because that's a, a, an important discussion. So finish your thing. So with the electronic music company, electric music company. Recording, <laughs> yeah, I told you, it's difficult yeah, to right. remember. Electric <laughs> recording company. Are copies, are they doing the Love album? Yes, and it comes at the end of the month, also 300 copies. When they announced it, it was gone within 15 to 20 minutes. And how much were they selling for? Very cheap, uh, 300 British pounds. 
That's around 400 of your- Very cheap, very cheap. See, to this audience, they're thinking $400 for a friggin' record. Now, what's the difference? And maybe you don't know this yet because you haven't heard it, obviously. Why would I buy that $400 record instead of this $50 record? Or four, I can get that for $40 maybe. And this is 45 RPM. Is there it's 33, do you know? It's uh, from, from MoFi, or, but the electric recording company is 33. 33? They're going to put out 33? Yeah. And, and something very special. Okay. Mono. Mono. Or the mono one. The mono one. So, and that's, is there a mono one? I'm not I don't so know. sure. This is 1967. Yeah, there probably was a mono. And I'm trying to think. I also have a Rhino version of this. I don't have the original anymore. I don't have mm. the original. I've never had the original. This is one record I missed. I didn't hear it until maybe 15 years ago. I can't believe I missed it growing up. Just never heard it, even though I worked in stores. It just passed me by. It was a cult album until so recently. No, no, there is uh, because, and then they made a photograph of the uh, master tape. And the master tape showed stereo. Hmm. So I know everybody who bought that record is afraid that it is a fold down mono copy. You know, that they take the stereo right. and make it a mono. And it's, it's a big discussion, but I, I have some of their releases and I have a lot of trust in them because this, these are not your typical all your file productions. Right. They really do very, the star is this autophone uh, machine. And people out there are listening to this now, watching this and saying, why, how can a record be $400? I know, there, I know about collector rare things, and I'm playing devil's advocate here because you know, I collect these Genesis books, that, and these books have been, you don't want to know how much. Of course, you know, the George Harrison book I, I know. paid, I mean mine in the 80s, or I paid two, $300 for it in the 80s. It's worth $3,000, $4,000 now. It's signed. Why is this worth it when I can listen to that record? What is, are they, are they hand screening those covers like the Donald Bird? Yeah. You should they're, show they're, the Donald Bird and explain that too, because that might, uh, you know, that's, I think that's real, that to me got, I got hooked on them, although I haven't bought and I'm not buying those and that's already sold out. I you know. won't get it. Yeah. You won't get it anymore. You have to be quick with those stuff. Yeah, the question, is it worth 300 uh, British pound? Uh, the answer, of course, is yes, because it's sold out after 20 minutes. They that's have like the chicken and the hen thing. That's a funny, I mean, that's an interesting example. It's, it's worth it because it's sold. Yeah. That's we an argument that, that some world. people hate to hear, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I have a copy of, of an electric recalling company. It's a classic one. And it got sold in May on Discogs. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw they put out a list every month, most expensive sold by Discogs. It was place number four. It was sold for $2,760. What was that? A classical one. You have it? Uh, I have it. You have it handy? Can we see it? I have it in my vault. <laughs> oh, I read it. Okay, that, there's an argument right there someone's going to say. If, if, what good is it in your vault if you can't, first of all, you got a vault. <laughs> no, that's... I'm living in Germany, you have to have one. Okay. Um, I want to play this music. I want to play this record. I don't want to hide it away. I don't want it behind a glass cage. That's the argument some people are going to say, like, fuck this shit, you know, how these people, they think they're rich. I mean, you and I aren't, I mean, we're oh, doing not, really fine, we're working, we're, we, we have our priorities. I, mean, I, I, I didn't, super rich. I, I bought it for 300 British pounds, so. Yeah, which is still a lot, but now you could. Which is still a lot, of course. Yeah. You could which sell it, that's your retirement, if ever you want to sell it, you know. Um, and, uh, do you have that Donald Bird handy, you know, you could share, is it, or is that in your vault too? <laughs> While he's there, I'm going to just go through a few more um, MoFi, Rai Cooters, the Rai Cooters, uh, MoFi, Rai Cooters. Love the sound of Rai Cooter. Um, now, just before he shows that, I'm going to show two more. These two records sound amazing, but 
I'm, I'm Jared Center Airplane fan. Seristic Pillow is one is a is an amazing rock album. I grew up in San Francisco. I've said that countless times. This is not an audiophile recording. A lot of reverb was added. It was at the time that uh, RCA Studios in LA didn't really know how to record rock and roll loud bands. But this 45 Mobile Fidelity is the best this record has ever sound. And I've heard this record thousands of times, this music. And I love this. 45 RPM, two LPs. And again, this is where a MoFi really shines and, and makes this record sound friggin' amazing. Okay, you have Donald Bird there? Yeah, here we go. Now I want you to explain the process. Maybe what I'll do is I'll put a link down because there is a YouTube video showing how they printed this cover. Forget the music for a second. We'll talk about that. These were hand printed, you know, with the inks and the colored inks and everything. Like you'd make handmade posters every I single copy. I only knew the German uh, uh, name for that kind of, it's Siebdruck. Um. I don't know the English term yeah, for it. It's, um, and I'm I used to know it because I, I have a lot of friends who used to make uh, posters and uh, handmade uh, art pieces. Um, it's not letterpress. You know, letterpress is where you, no. I mean, yeah, when you type the, or type. The electric recording yeah. companies are letterpress. Yeah. Um, but this one, I, I'm very sorry. I only know Siebdruck in, in German. That's okay. But this is, is, is true, true beauty. Yeah. Let's talk about the sound of this because tell me, this is for sure not an audio file recording, but it's a very special recording because it is in a very very small club. I would say thirty to fifty spectators, and there he goes on. It never was meant to be sounding like like a hurricane, but this atmosphere of this concert is so well put on this record i love that i don't I, I i i'm not the guy who always needs this huge sound stage and separation and dynamics that also can be atmospheres which are just beautiful and stunning even even <laughs> here these are the 50s these are the 60s and that comes through it sometimes it got a little blended out too much. Sometimes I like to hear this is an old recording. Now, let me ask you this with them, because I don't know. I mean, I've only, you know, I go on the Hoffman forums and there's a whole thread on the electric recording company, as well as Sam, the other uh, high end company, as well as Music Matters and everything else. One little correction. A, a, Sam, a Sam record is 28 euros. This is. Right. This, the sorry. Artemis series, it's from Sam, but they started that. This is the first part or edition of the Artemis series. Now let me, but let me ask you that about that. I saw the video and I saw the two gentlemen doing the uh, screening. It's like, they call it something screen, uh, screen prints. Um, I like to do the old Fillmore posters and Avalon poster, ballroom posters in the 60s. Um, are the same gentlemen who is mastering these records? Do they have, do they have expertise? Like when you go to Music Matters Jazz, a lot of us who know audiophile have heard of Kevin Gray at Coherent, or or Joe Harley with Kevin Gray, or Steve Hoffman, or you know Ron McMaster, different uh, audio uh, mastering engineers. Bob Ludwig, everyone knows about because of Led Zeppelin and many other things. Who's doing that for them? What I know of them is that this is a French non-profit one-man show. And he's, he's an audio a, genius. Yes, audio fanatic who does unbelievable beautiful covers with great audiophile editions. And, and, and they are pulling, they are going up now. The next edition is already announced. Uh, in, the, in the first years, there were one or two uh, um, editions now they are up to six seven eight editions per year and do people subscribe or is it a one-off each time you can buy that also for store acoustics you can buy them oh you get, get them so he does resell them 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just Both. only directly through him. No, you, you can order direct on the website, but you, in the meantime, you, you also can buy those uh, records in America. Well, that should lead us to uh, this next segment, and we can come back if we need to as we go, because we should talk about that. And I think that leads us a very popular uh, series of records right now on the vinyl community and on YouTube in general are Blue Note reissues, Blue Note records. And a lot of people have been listening and hearing about Tone Poets, and we'll get into that. And I've done like several Tone Poet videos, everyone's showing Tone Poet. Tone Poet is probably the best bang for your buck of anything, and they're great records. Even the uh, Blue Note 80, the covers are wimpy, but they're at least analog. But Music Matters Jazz um, started out, I don't know, something like 15 years ago, give or take, uh, by Ron Rambach and Joe Harley, I believe. Yes. And they came originally out at a time when vinyl wasn't didn't have the resurgence it was a really narrow audience I, as i recall i mean i know because i was you know wasn't buying records for a 15 20 year period i was back in the cds and i got back into it and so they were able to license blue note records and they started doing 45 rpms later they did 33s 45 rpms and they did these amazing tipped on covers and we'll show you some uh, limited editions of either 20 i think 2500 to 3500 right um i think i have like this is yeah i mean we all have different ones one, know, this is one of both one, uh, one of my both terrific great great covers i just like this because um North Beach, San Francisco, Grant and Green is an actual street corner in North Beach with a club right below it. Um, but I love it. These are the 45 RPM versions. Now, the thing about it is this, these were limited editions. They were sold through retailers and direct at the time initially. They were selling at the time for about $35 to $45 in that range. You know, they were imported to the UK. And they were selling steady, but they weren't selling out right away. You could, over a year, two, three, and some of them are still available, you could buy certain titles. Um, all analog. Initially, they were uh, mastered by Kevin Gray and Steve Hoffman. Um, but in those days, and this is before Don was, was at uh, Blue Note, ran Blue Note, it was probably very reasonable, I would imagine, to license this stuff because, you know, Blue Note wasn't really you know, the record, bit, and unfortunately labels don't know what the fuck they have until someone else does it and then they realize, oh my God, you know, it's like universal with the fires and master tapes getting destroyed. But the value of these, the market for these has really changed. And then I want you to talk about them a little more. They started doing more 33s. I got into them about four years ago. So I was not late, but not early on. I have about, you, are, you are still one of the lucky ones. Yeah, I have about that was early enough in enough. price, and there's a whole obscene story there if we we may or may not get into. Um, but about a year or two ago, two years ago, they pulled back everything in house, and they only sell direct. They don't sell to retailers. Mainly, th their excuse was people were buying these on the market, especially in Europe and other areas, and selling them for two, three, four times the price. Hey capitalism at its finest, I guess, but they were losing out. But then you could say, well, shit, it doesn't matter. They're selling it. So they started going like the stock market. Their prices were going up and down. But talk about Music Matters, it, what your opinion and how you see them. I, I, one, one sentence. I think with the jazz of the late 50s and, and, and 60s, you get the best sounding records that ever will be those are the best sounding records of all time because you have a group group of people where everybody knows what they do there was rudy van gelder who recorded that a, a group of unbelievable musicians in in and all analog you you it can't get better it can't get any better on vinyl than this records. And, and not only music matters, that also goes for the 50 analog productions of, of Blue Note. Right. Um, right. 
they, they did something wrong with the cover, but come on. Yeah, the, the, what, the, the difference is uh, the analog productions were all single covers. Even if it was a double album, they were in a single cover. They didn't have these amazing tipped on things. Also, um, the, the great photographs by Francis Wolf, uh, the archive, when he, after he died, his widow sold the, this is where I know something about, because I know about photo, photographs and licensing. Smart move. Michael Cascuna, who uh, used to also run Blue Note and a great uh, jazz archive, archivist that started Mosaic Records, and um, him and his wife bought the Francis Wolf archive. So my guess is they, have a, they did a deal with uh, Music Matters initially, and now with Tone Poet, where they license photographs from the sessions in here. And so they made these beautiful gatefold covers. They go back and unlike some of some of uh, analog productions, and especially the cheapo like Blue Note seventy five in house things, they re almost reset the type. And I've heard I'm not sure exactly what they do. And re I mean the covers don't look blurry. The, the, I mean these are wonderful collector's items, but as Michael said, they sound so amazing. And you know I don't buy them for value, but every time you buy them, like like this one, this is a. Um, uh, this is the SRX, I'm not sure, uh, series. Already they're out of print and they're, they sell, these records sell for a minimum of like usually $125, $150 up into two and three hundred dollars. Are you talking record. about the SRX? Well, the SRX was a lot of them, the, the out of print ones. Yeah, and, and, it, and you don't get them at all. <laughs> right, right. Right so, to get them. It's an expensive endeavor. I mean, this one alone, this came out on SRX and literally it sold out in 20 minutes. Uh, and um, you know, it's gone now, unless you buy it. I, I, I was very lucky, Messi. I got mine for 140 euros. Yeah. And that is really but I lucky. paid $80. <laughs> so is that, that's a lot of money for a friggin' record. Yeah, it is. But it, it is. sounds great. I had a... Um, a set. Now, the thing we should mention about Music Matters and, and Music Matters and Tone Poet with Joe Harley, Ron and, and Kevin and um, Kevin Gray and back when Steve Hoffman was doing them. Their decision, the mastering decision was different than if you listen to an original Blue Note record, Rudy Van Gelder cuts, they're amazing. They're, they got spirit, they got, they got balls, but they don't have a lot of bass. They, I mean, they're, they're clipped. And they're clipped intentionally because at the time, the 50s and 60s, the people, hi-fis, record players people have, couldn't handle what these records sound like today. It's kind of like the old story that all you rock and roll people have heard about, the uh, Robert Ludwig Led Zeppelin II, where, you know, the, the awesome. hot cut would jump off uh, uh, was it Arif Martin's or uh, Emmett Erdogan's daughter's record yeah. player? So they recut it. That's why everyone friggin' wants an RL because it's got balls. They couldn't do that then. So the mastering now of Tone Poet, Music Matters Jazz, even Blue Note 80, they're going to try to match the original tapes as much as possible. So they will <laughs> not sound different. Now, you may prefer originals. I have friends that collect originals and and the thing is, if you think eighty dollars is a lot, it is. An original of this, a real original, a thousand dollars. Maybe you'll get lucky a for mint a couple. One? A mint one? No, more, much more. Okay, see, look at Japan market or loans. Yes. All the Japanese came here when when people were dumping their record collections and buying all these collections and shipping everything back to Japan. I had I had a very interesting evening with a friend. We we drove to somebody with an incredible uh, good equipment and he had an, an tape uh, machine so he put on a direct copy of a master from i think it was the sidewinder a direct copy from the master reel to reel or what they call it and the most interesting stuff was that no vinyl will reach that quality yeah this one and but the audiophile record was much nearer because my friend has an uh, original pressing from, from the Sidewinder. I had the uh, audiophile one and the audiophile one was much closer to the tape. 
than the original pressing because of the limitations you, 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 you uh, uh, spoke of. They had to cut it. They had to cut the high end and the low end because otherwise they couldn't hear it on, on their record players at that time. You know, we should mention a little bit uh, because these records will sound good on any good, decent stereo system. That's the point. Yeah. You don't need to have a $100,000 system. You don't have to have a $10,000 system. You do need a good system. And sometimes when you're listening to music, and I'm the same way, because those of you who have watched me before, I mean, maybe there's new people here, but I have thousands of records. And sometimes it's not to me, I'm not an audiophile in terms of I'm a purist. And sometimes what drives people crazy, I want to get back to this discussion, because a lot of the people that watch my channel are, are vinyl enthusiasts that not necessarily or aren't audiophile. They, that, that snooty thing about it, because you see someone with this hundred or $50,000 stereo, and it seems like they have, you know, a hundred records and it's all about the sound and they almost don't give a shit about the music. And if something is a great, I mean, I have plenty of records that are great lo-fi records and I just, there's amongst my favorite records. Mm -hmm. You listen to Dylan, John Wesley Harding or Bruce Springsteen, Nebraska. I mean, that maybe those are extremes in a way. Um, you know, even, I mean, the Beatle records aren't audiophile records. As good as Sgt. Pepper sounds, and it sounds friggin' great. Remember, that was recorded on a four track and they literally went, you know, all these layers and multi layers. So you're hearing already four generations or something by the time it comes out the door. But it's incredible what they've done. So um, I, I consider I have a, a nice system. It, you know, I have B&W speakers and most audiophiles call them lifestyle speakers. They like to mock Bowers and Wilkins speakers because they're not high end unless you get the, what is it, the 800s or the eight, those big uh, roundest speakers or something. And they're made in uh, China now, the level I have. I have, what I have, if you're interested, they're called um, uh, 702S2s. They sound great in my room. It took a uh, hundred hours to break in or so. And they sound really good. I have a Rotel amp that I've had for 18 years. I need to improve on that, but it sounds damn good. Could it sound better? Probably, but I love it. I mean, you almost don't know. You're satisfied with what you have, and I'm very satisfied. I have a, a Riga RPA turntable, and literally for the first time I, in the last six months, I upgraded to a, a MC moving coil cart from an MM cart. I have a, um, uh, what's it, a, uh, uh, Japanese, I'm, I'm blanking it. I'll think of it later. Um, and I can tell the difference, but everything needs to cohabitate and you could get a great speaker and a shitty turntable and the, you know, it, it doesn't all have to be expensive, but it has to gel. What's the word I'm thinking in German? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Intertwine. <laughs> I don't even know what it, what, yeah. You yeah. Know, it, it's, it, things work together yes but but i think it, it doesn't matter what system you have if you put on a music matters edition it it will be better than other editions of than a digital pressing it, it doesn't matter what system you have right. this one will sound great on your system this is one of the most incredible sounding records i mean uh it's it's Midnight Blue is Kenny Burrell's most famous record, and it's an incredible. It's got a great groove to it. It's it's not um, heavy. It's got Tanley Turn Turntine on sax, but it's not heavy with um, with uh, horns at all. Um, I want to show something with the SRX. It's that's great. Wait. I just have to put on the light on my... Wait a sec. We'll talk about these two as we go along. These are tone poets. Yeah, sure. I, I just have to put on a light. And the difference in similarities yeah. with tone poets. Can you see that? Oh, right. The SRX series is yeah. a series of Music Matters Jazz. It does a 
different vinyl formula. It costs them more because it's harder to press. It takes longer to press. They're slightly transparent. You hold them up to the light and you can see somewhat through them, you see the glow of the light. Supposedly, in theory, and it is true, they have a, uh, a more, what am I called? They're quieter, a quieter sound stage in between tracks behind the music, which, you know, when you're going around, you're cooking, you're drinking your espresso, drinking your, you know, you don't listen to that stuff. That's the, the whole thing with some of these records, difference in how you listen. Do you have a sweet spot? Are you focusing in? If you're putting for background music, I put on, you know, my hard drive with music. I put on CDs. It's a different uh, point of, of really paying attention. We talked about this the other day. We did a little preview. Is it a lonely experience to be an audiophile? Do you sit in your chair and your girlfriend or your wife and your boyfriend or your husband thinks you're crazy? Are you sneaking records in the house because you paid $500 or $200 or $10 yeah. or whatever? More records? <laughs> Your mother, what? when I was a kid, Why? I used to sneak records in when I was a kid because I would buy records with my allowance for my jobs I had. And I had a record, this, this is my record collection. And my mother blinked and walks in my room a month later. My record collection's like this. She didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> lucky you, lucky you. I don't, yeah. she, I don't think she no. cared. In, in Germany, it is a lonely hobby because when, when I got visitor and, and I said, what is that? Are those records? You can still buy those things? I said, yeah, if you're lucky sometimes. It is a different thing. I have a, a handful of friends, uh, only, only a couple local here now that I'm in Seattle, but in San Francisco I had some. But except for uh, one of my friends in San Francisco, they all moved on from vinyl. Even people who I was in the record business with in the 70s, they're on to something else now. We should mention um, the tone, since, since we're into Music Matters Jazz and we can continue that conversation, Joe Harley, who was half of Music Matters, all of a sudden um, got pulled in by Blue Note and offered a deal he couldn't refuse. Don was became the became the president um, of Blue Note in the last eight nine years ago, and on the seventy fifth anniversary of Blue Note, they put a series of records out because retailers in America wanted these great Blue Note titles at a very reasonable cost. They wanted them to sell for 20 to 25, $23 retail. Well, to sell a record for that price, there are compromises. So those are digitally sourced. Well, digitally sourced isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the Blue Note 75, at least the first few, I bought the first two, I remember, I forgot which titles they were, and they sounded like shit. They, they were noisy, the vinyl, they, they were pressed badly. I don't remember where they were pressed, but they were horrible. I tried two more. I, and I remember writing to Blue Note five or six times, never got a response, which I kind of didn't like. But anyway, cut a few years later, they put out all these records. I think they sold pretty well, but I think Don was realized they got so much flack, he wanted to do it right. He saw what Music Matters was doing. He saw that they could sell records for... $35, $50 of the titles that were in their vaults. And so he called Joe Harley to come over and said, hey, can you do this for us? Can you do a line for us? And Joe Harley said, look, I can, but he laid down the law, the rules. I need Kevin Gray coherent to master him. I need to do Stroughton Printing, who does these wonderful, you know, amazing gatefold covers, thick stock, I need them pressed at, are they pressed at RTI, I think? The, the tone poets are pressed at R R RTI? Yeah, that is, that Chet Baker is amongst my favorite. I, I put that out because this is my favorite tone poet. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And it's we want to license images from, from the Francis Wolf archive from Michael Cuscuna. And he said, fine. And he did it his way. Yeah. They, they're pressing, okay, the difference is they're pressing about 10,000. They are a major label, opposed to the 35 or 2,500 Music Matters. These list for $35. You can usually get them as low as 26 in America. What a bargain. I've been buying almost every single one because, now they're not limited. They're going to stay in print, at least for the near future. And the thing is, with, because of the Music Matters licensing, so far... They cannot do any of those titles. And unfortunately, those are some of the 
titles in demand, the, 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 the sidewinder. I'm sure once that licensing dies, we'll see. Now it might be in two or three or four years, who knows when. So and be reasonable. it might go up a little bit, but, um, and they sell retail. So they're not limited uh, in the same way. Which, which for sure is a good thing, but I think they never will do 45 RPMs. No, I because don't... the audience, okay, they let's, don't like talk, let's talk don't... about that. I, I didn't like, I resisted 45 RPM records for a lot of reasons. First of all, it wrecks the mood. You're having a glass of, I have my martini. I'm having a martini, right? And a glass of wine, maybe. Woman sitting next to me. I get down one button. I get down two buttons. Oh, this sounds really sexy. No, I'm kidding. You got to flip the record over. You lose the momentum. I'm kidding. Don't get all wonky on me. No, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely, of course. The, the, or the music, the way the music is sequenced. You know, like, like maybe jazz records, not a much, because there's like an eight minute song or a 10 minute song. It's different. But if you're doing, let's say, Sgt. Pepper or a, 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 the Who's Tommy, after three, after the overture, you're ready to move on. You want to turn it over. I mean, they don't have a Tommy 45, I don't think. But oh, but classic recordings did, and this one is great. <laughs> and but but Messi, these records are all about being the best it can be, and a 45 has sound-wise its advantages. Right. They're slightly more dynamic. And, you know, when it comes to the end of a record side, you have this skating effect. Yeah? The needle is pressed against the outer side of the uh, uh, um, rille. <laughs> this is a needle inside the record. And there is a skating effect, which, which really makes the sounding uh, worse. So on a 45, they can play. If you have, there are some 45s where only one, one song on one side, because this is one of the main songs, of the most important songs. And so you have this much song and this much dead wax. It's all and about the that, sound. In a perfect, wonderful, non-A or AB world, that is a stunning thing. I've heard the difference. I love the difference. I resisted for a long time with the Music Matters. I started buying them because those were the only ones that were left. And now the prices are even, luckily I got in, they weren't cheap, but they're crazy. Yeah. But they do sound amazing. Again, sometimes you don't want that. And a lot of people, you know, I'm not usually one. And in fact, in jazz, I hardly, I'm not doubling up. So I won't get an SRX when that mm -hmm. came out if I already had the rig. Although I recently bought that Kenny Burrell and I'm a good friend of mine wants one. So I'm sending him my other one, but I'm, I could flip it easily for a lot more money. And I yeah, don't sure. want to do that. I don't need two copies of that. Of course, my obsession with the Beatles, I have multi copies and that's a whole different thing. How will you hold up with all the Beatles records that comes out in the next years when the rights in Europe are free? You will still be a completionist? Probably, you know, I. I We'll see how that goes. I know they're still kind of talking about that with the 50 year uh, copyright thing in the European. Okay, it doesn't have to be in this show, I, I, but that's I thought a whole about discussion it. about gray market versus European yeah. rights. Uh, no, yeah. I think, I think I'm good right now. Um, but Sorry, just a little sidestep. I do want to show now. Okay. There are sometimes not everything audiophile. Let's maybe let's kind of wind down and go in this direction, but we can, yeah. Is there anything, before I get into this direction, is there anything you want to show specifically? No, no, no. Okay. I, I follow your lead, go on. Okay. Not everything is crazy expensive. expensive. Michael talked about electric recording company. Is that right? Four or $500 crazy price. Um, we all know Music Matters, $80 on a secondary market, 150, 200, $300. We know original uh, pressings can be hundreds or thousands, if, unless you're lucky at pristine things. There are some great things. Again, we showed Tone Poet. You can get them for 26 bucks. Now, a lot of people maybe watching think that's a lot for a record and they want to pay three or five or ten dollars. And I, I own, I get that. I've said this before on my channel. I think I'm at the end of my thing of going into record stores and bringing back records that I open up and I'm, and I got them for 
five or six bucks that are because I wanted that record so much, but I get a headache because of the mildew, the mold, you know, yeah. just and then or you get it back and it's shitty and you buy four or five copies until you get a good one. So you're paying 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars anyway. I'd rather narrow it down. I know what I'm getting. One of the artists in a, uh, here who does it pretty damn good has been Neil Young. This is one yeah. example. Neil Young thinks he goes to the uh, original master tapes. I don't have the first box, but I do have an individual copy of Harvest and um, uh, uh, the black and white covered one. I'm blanking out here. Um, and this is a second box. Oh, Massey Hall, one of the most amazing sounding records. Now, that's like a $40, $50 record, or, or, as I recall. Um, it's a $140 record because it's the classic recordings. Oh, okay. Actually, I have that one. But, it's, it's, but anyway, it's Neil, I don't have that. I, anyway, I, Neil Young takes care in his sound and sometimes to, he's obsessive about it. He puts something out and doesn't put it out. But his records go to the source. Reissues have been aud audiophile. And for the most part, reasonably priced, except like he said, classic records that doesn't exist anymore. They used to do um, the, the little Ze Led Zeppelin box. And I do have Led Zeppelin two, a classic version of that. That's the only one I have. Right. And it sounds great. And I got it like for $30 at a record show and the guy didn't really realize what it was. If, if you're into Led Zeppelin and want to have real good copies, go for the 200 gram classic quiet x vinyl uh, editions from classic recordings they are up to 250 dollars but yeah. but uh, those those yeah but but what what do you have to pay for a latrick right right, right. Two, 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 two and a half thousand so you know so <laughs> audio file can be scary to people and again we, we you, you, I subscribe to some audiophile channels that are about equipment, and I look at these things, and they're just these these rooms look perfect and pristine. And and I, I've I've said to you, Michael, that my I'm in down to my office right now that's heavy carpeted and it's got you know books and CDs and and it's fairly dead, but it's got a friggin' drum set here, and so that's not good. Old JBL 100 speakers that audiophiles don't like. But I put CDs on here and it sounds fantastic. It sounds fun. Upstairs, my room is live. It's a combination of carpets and wood floors. There's a kitchen area, friggin' countertops. So it's not a dead room where all the audio files want their man cave or, or you know, it's not that. But I love it. I enjoy the music. But I do hear the difference with all these records that I we showcase today. And I, and, it's it it's valuable to me to spend that money um you know and if i was you were talking about getting rid of some electronic records and getting rid of some of your collection that you don't listen to and i hope you're not getting rid of them because they're not like these audiophile no 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 no, 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 no. but it's because they're a music you just I'm don't connect it it's it's nothing i'm not connected to it okay in a way i'm connected to this kind of music and to this kind of records. Because there is so much, believe me, I, I've met some people who are in that business and, and they do care so much about their products and, and put so much effort in it. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm completely connected to that kind of things. I I, I, for a while, I did get a little snooty about this, these audio file releases, because I found, even though I'm in that age group, that perfect uh, boomers age group, yeah. every time I would see MoFire, these audio file companies, they'd, they'd release the same goddamn records. They'd release Dire Straits. Hey, I like yeah. Dire Straits, but how many t fucking times do you have to re-release that? They released Super Tramp. I can't, I can't stand Super Tramp, but they released Crime <laughs> of the Century over and over. over, I mean, and over. Yeah. The Dark Side of the Moon, you know, I, I like, I love the record. I love the record. I actually like the, um, the reissues they did a few years ago. I mean, I think they're not analog. The, James Guthrie did the reissue program and it actually sounds really, really good. Same, he also did the Kate Bush record. I'm a Kate Bush fan. Those sound really good. 
Um, but I, I found that they were doing these same records. No, there is a new, there will be a new series uh, uh, from acoustic, uh, from analog. And with what, what is in the first two releases gets Gilberto. I don't have a good copy of that though. So I, I pre-ordered that. Uh, <laughs> But see, you know, a lot of us want the impulse stuff done the way the music matters. Yes. Unfortunately, a lot of that stuff was in the universal fire. So a lot of the tapes are not available. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm so eager to get uh, uh, Alice Coltrane, uh, Pharaoh Sanders. Why not? They are great. <laughs> yeah. But, well, you but need not another, maybe, it, maybe if music matters, of course, Ron may want to retire now. Someone like that, a third party, needs to yeah. do it right if they can get those things. Because, you know, if they look at companies like um, Blue Note now doing their own version in their way, I wish Maybe. other people would do that. You know, another good oh. thing, I have the analog production box set of the Nat King Cole story that Steve Hoffman did, and it's friggin' amazing. That stuff at Capitol Records sounds, sounds you know, wonderful. I think I have... I don't, I didn't bring out a lot, but this time, but the other artist that is good is, Mo oh, I don't have that version. Yeah. I want to show this no. because Mo has been doing some good uh, 45 RPM miles stuff. Um, yeah, they have rhythm. Most of it is really, really good. And these things are, are getting to be far and, you know, few and far between, I can't even talk today. Few and far <laughs> between, it's hard to get these, you know, so. I, this is this is an has a nice story I think for for audio files because it's it's an impulse it's from analog and it was gone and you really have to pay uh, have to pay a lot of money it was I think around 250 270 euros yeah. and one day suddenly it was back it was back in print and now you get it for 49 dollars uh, mofi sometimes um does come back it depends on how many they're pressing i don't and the thing is you never know that's the thing if if there's a record you really want uh the key i think uh, the end that michael and i agree on you have you should if you can afford it pull the buy trigger it. buy it before you pay secondary prices because if it if, if it is pressed later you probably won't pay any more than that if you buy in the secondary market you may pay less it depends on the label um but, but not but much you just never know if you pay less it, it will be two three four dollars right no, but if you if you order it pre you're on the sure side you get it and and all is good right and you have a perfect copy i think this has been a good discussion and i, I like the audiophile side but i just wanted to make sure uh, especially to most of my audience here it's this is not a snooty approach to it it's just it's two guys I hope so. <laughs> telling their opinion on other sides of the world and um, we love the music. It comes down to the music more than anything else. But when you do hear the difference of these records on, you know, on decent equipment, it doesn't have to be high end crazy shit. Decent is all right. Clean, clean equipment, the clean stylus and, you know, clean sound. Um, it's, it's just, it's, 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 it'll, it'll change your opinion of this stuff. Okay. I think we've uh, covered anything for now. Maybe we'll do a, another segment of something like this if, if people like it. Put your comments in below. Any last words about that, Michael? Like closing about? No, I think you have put it very well. I completely agree. Decent stereo is enough to get in audiophile records. Try it out. You probably will love it. Maybe you'll even get addicted. <laughs> Which is crazy but yeah. you know we're uh, some of us are stuck home during this pandemic this is in 220 july 220 this has been recorded and we have a lot more time to listen to records although i work at home anyway so i listen to records a lot well thanks michael and Thank you um, for having me. this is fun i love this stuff so write your comments please subscribe i'll put a link to michael's channel too if you like audiophile uh he has about maybe 10 videos so far give or take uh really interesting stuff i got addicted just how he talks about uh it, it's kind of a, the, the way he talks it's a sexy approach to this music to this these objects of art 
and music. And um, he's not snarky like me, so it's a, a serious approach. <laughs> but he, it's just it's an easy way of uh, learning more about it. So I'm a, I'm subscriber to him. You should subscribe to him and tell him Mazzy sent you. Thank you. Mazzy loves you. <laughs>